Y'all get ready. Yes, you get ready. You want the latest news in the streets? Join us and tune in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So sell your friends and your family. It's the lovely TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Hey, tea sippers. Hope you guys are doing good. Happy Friday. I cannot believe how fast this week has gone by already. So last night I was up editing my deep dive. I was up till about 2.30 in the morning, just working, 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 chugging away. Um, so volume four will be coming up soon of my Diddy deep dive. So anyhow, I had got done. I was getting ready for bed, but I really couldn't sleep. So I literally stayed up till like, I really stayed up like the whole morning. And so once again, K dot, he dropped. And so when I was getting ready to lay down after being up all night editing, it dropped, and so I ran to YouTube because people were tagging me. I went to go listen to it, and um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and definitely get into this because a lot of people want to know my opinions on the song and to do like a small breakdown. I'm not going to do a full breakdown like I do on live. There are just some parts that really stood out to me in the song that I do want to talk about. So yeah, we're definitely going to get up into it, okay? So first and foremost, the song. All right, so let's talk about the cover for the single. So what's really interesting, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. The cover is some gloves, okay? So I take this one a few ways. The glove low-key reminds me of OJ. Y'all remember, if the glove doesn't fit, you must quit. okay? That comes from Johnny Cochran, so that low-key reminds me of that. And then the glove also has the MMG logo on there. So I feel like he's also paying like a little bit of homage to, you know, Ricky Ross, a.k.a. Officer Ricky, because he also dropped the diss track on Drake called Champagne Moments. And he's literally been trolling Drake ever since. Calling him a white boy, calling him BBL Drizzy. Rick Ross has been keeping his big ass foot on the back of Drake's neck, okay? So I think that was low-key Kendrick Lamar paying homage to Rick Ross and possibly OJ. And the reason why I say OJ is because the song is called 616. And for y'all who don't know, um, Nicole Brown Simpson, who was the wife of OJ at the time, she was killed on June 16th, 1994. And then exactly a year to the day, OJ went on trial on June 16th, 1995. That's why I kind of feel like the um, album cover, I feel like that's a, you know, paying homage to OJ. And maybe low key Kendrick is saying that I'm going to kill this white boy just like OJ killed that white woman. I'm just saying, I'm not calling Drake white, but we all know that Rick Ross calls Drake white. So this might be kind of like a, you know what I'm saying? Some type of symbolism. Like, yeah, you better watch it, white boy. You feel me? <laughs> so now on top of that, another meaning for this album, 616, um, could also be alluding to Euphoria. As we all know, Drake is an executive producer of Euphoria, and Euphoria first debuted on June 16th, 2019. And, you know, like I said, us tea sippers, we really got into euphoria. That was my show. We did podcasts on it. You know, we had watch parties. So this was a big deal when this dropped. A lot of people really like euphoria. And, you know, Drake is an executive producer. So this whole numbering thing means a lot of stuff. So as you guys see, it dropped June 16th of 2019. So I definitely feel like Kendrick is like, once again, being very, very strategic, not only with his verses in this song, but with the title, just like he did with the diss track Euphoria. So now on top of that, um, during this, you know, diss track, he's talking a lot about the Bible and God and things like that. So we all know, you know, Kendrick is like a Christian slash Hebrew Israelite. So I also feel like, um, uh, 616 also alludes to two Bible verses. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and show you guys those two Bible verses right now. So one of the Bible verses is Corinthians 616. And this is what it says. It says, do not know that he unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body, for it is said two will become one flesh. Now, I believe that's a shot 
towards Drake's baby mama. Now, granted, she's not a prostitute in the terms prostitute where she's standing in the corner like, I'll give you a blowjob for $10. She ain't that type of prostitute, but she is a porn star, meaning that at one point in time, she worked in the sex industry and, you know, she sold her cat, you know what I'm saying, for, you know what I'm saying, for a check. I'm not judging. I'm just telling you that was her occupation. And Drake decided to hit that raw and get her pregnant. So I think that, you know, the 616 could also be alluding to that Bible verse about Drake's baby mama. Okay, just saying. So now the other Bible verse that people are also tying to this is this. Luke 616. And in Luke 616, it says this. Judas, son of James, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Okay, so remember that word traitor because that's going to be definitely talked about in this diss track. So again, we haven't even gotten into the song and just the title 616, there's just so many references there. And then on top of that, okay, continue with the 616 um, thread is um, June 16th is also Tupac's birthday. Kendrick Lamar's birthday is June 17th, okay? Which means he's closer to Tupac. You know what I'm saying? Energy-wise, they're both Geminis. They're a day apart. So I believe that's also why he chose 616. And then also, let's not forget that in Canada, okay? What's up, Curly? In Canada, all the Curlies out there, all the men, they celebrate Father's Day this year in 2024, on June 16th. So once again, alluding to Drake's lack of quote unquote being a father. Now today, Drake did post a picture of himself with his son and you know, Adonis. Um, we ain't seen Adonis in a while, but it looks like not only did Pusher T force Drake to come out and finally admit that, you know, he had a child that he was hiding from the world. But now Kendrick is talking about his parenting skills and what, 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 what do you know? Here comes Adonis, okay, with his daddy. So I thought that was very interesting. Drake must have ran to Paris overnight on the Jedi, grabbed his son for a photo op. We see you, boo. So now on top of that, right, another thing is, if you guys know Drake's music, Drake is very fond of using timestamps, okay? He has a lot of really dope songs with timestamps in them. So I also think that that is what Kendrick is doing. He's low-key trolling Drake as well. So Drake, like I said, is the king of timestamps. Some of his most popular songs include 9 a.m. in Dallas, 7 a.m. on the Brittle Path, 6 p.m. in New York. That's the jam. I love that album. Um, 8 a.m. in Charlotte, 5 a.m. in Toronto, 4 p.m. in Calabasas. So again, Drake is like the king of using timestamps as, um, you know, album names and things like that, song names on his albums. So I also feel like Kendrick is also, you know, trolling him for that as well. Like, not only am I going to call this diss track 616, which goes off of these timestamps that you love to use, but it's going to have so many multiple meanings behind that. So we see you, Kendrick. We see you. You know, Kendrick is going to go super deep with his disses, okay? That's one thing that you will get from a Kendrick Lamar diss track. So the other day when I was breaking down Euphoria, there was a bar in Euphoria where he talked about, you know, the back-to-back -back record. That was the song that basically he, he used to diss Meek Mill. Remember, he came out with Charged Up, then he ran and made Back to Back, and Back to Back was a really dope song. It ended up being nominated for a Grammy. And so um, on the Euphoria track, basically Kendrick was saying, you know, I like that record. That record was good. And he was calling Drake out on his hypocrisy. Like you literally dropped two records back to back. So Kendrick says, I'm going to get back to that record. So now we have Kendrick Lamar, you know, three days later, dropping a second diss track towards Drake. So I also believe that that was another double or actually triple entendre, if you ask me, um, concerning the situation. That's why he was saying, I'm going to get back to that record because he knew he had something else cooking in the kitchen. Okay. And so this song, 616, is that record that he's getting back to. Okay. Y'all get it? Y'all get it? Y'all with me? Y'all following me? So now on top of that, I liked it that part, you know, because I'm like, okay, that, that, you know what I'm saying? That makes sense. So now one last thing that also ties to June 6th um, is that on Twitter back in 2011, when Kendrick Lamar was, you know, finally getting a buzz, 
one of his first shows that he did in Toronto, Canada, which is in Drake's hometown. Um, basically, Jack Dorsey, who was the owner of Twitter way back then before Elon Musk, he took to Twitter to let the world know that Kendrick Lamar will be performing in Canada on what, you guessed it, June 16th, 2011. So once again, that 616 reference. So again, Kendrick really thinks things all the way out before he like just drops a project. So this is why it took him 17 days because he was actually thinking, okay? He wasn't just talking about small feet, short stature, and pants ripping. No shade to Drake because I did like that diss track, but I'm just saying Kendrick is going to bring you more. He's going to be a little bit deeper with it, and I'm not mad at it at all. So then as we get into the song, he's talking a lot about God, prayers, you know, tucking his kids in at night, being a good father, you know, basically still reiterating that Drake is a, you know, deadbeat father, allegedly. So then he goes on to talk about DJ academics and Kendrick says this, he says, yeah, somebody lying. I can see the vibes on AK. Even he looking compromised as I peel the layers back. Okay. So of course, DJ academics was super boosted when he heard that. Oh my God, I'm in a diss track. Oh, he's officially made it, right? Um, which, you know, I, I definitely get him for like being boosted. I would be boosted too. So of course. Um, so he feels like he has the right to say that he sides with Drake. He's a big Drake fan. He's been writing for Drake. That's one of his favorite artists. And, you know, let's keep it real. We're all, you know, we have our favorites in the game. That's just what it is. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's not going to be necessarily a fan of Kendrick. They may give him his props, but they don't really like the music. You know, some people are more of a fan of Drake because Drake puts out consistently. So, you know, AK is entitled to his opinion. But what I also find funny is that, you know, AK seems to think that he's really, really close to Drake. And maybe they have all types of private conversations. You know, I don't know. But it also seems like Drake low-key uses him. Like, he'll send him, you know what I'm saying, tracks and, you know, he'll like a post. But I don't think he really fools with him all like the way AK thinks he does. Um, even Ebro has touched on this. Y'all can check out this clip. Tapping and liking and leaving comments. Yo, academics, he don't fuck with you like that. But oh only y'all think he fuck out he again. He does not. He's using you. All right, so you guys just heard a snippet of what Ebro was saying. So that's what's been whispered in the industry, that Drake really doesn't fuck with him. And I see why people think that, because Drake has shown more love to Kai Sinat than he's really shown to AK publicly. Like, you see him, you know, on streams with Kai, FaceTiming him when he was with 21 Savage. Um, he even shouted him out in his song um, back in October on the All For My Dogs album. And then they've even taken pictures together. Um, Kai has done story times about Drake as well. Let me go ahead and share this with y'all. So I'm gonna play this quick snippet. This is Kai Sinet's, you know, like going off because he was mentioned in this song. What? What? Whoa, 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 whoa! What? No, 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 no! My youngest youngest and you rappers are the oh what? Damn naked pictures, it's a small thing. All right, so y'all just see how he freaks out so much about Drake. And then um, this was a picture of him and Drake not too long ago. So Kai Sinat speaks on meeting Drake. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a Drake in DJ Academics picture, but again, I don't follow everything he does, so maybe he has met Drake. Drake definitely shows Kai way more love publicly, but I get why AK is like super boosted because now he's been kind of drugged into this diss by Kendrick, you know what I'm saying? But I don't think that him siding with Drake because he is a really genuine big Drake fan and has been for years. I don't think that's really him being compromised because people have the right to choose their side. So I don't really agree with that, but I'm here for the bar either way. Now, if you guys remember, I talked about this when I was doing the breakdown of Drake's diss, drop and give me 50, drop and give me 50, okay? So in that um, diss track, he was saying basically he gets more love in his city than Kendrick does, right? He said he gets more love in Compton and California and stuff like that. And a lot of that is because he did the song a few years ago with the game where the game had him in Compton, you know what I'm saying? And he was doing his thing and they were showing him love. Now, what's very interesting is that basically 
If you guys don't know, went viral yesterday that the Chinese restaurant that Kendrick talked about in the Euphoria diss track, they have been getting, like, their business is literally booming, okay? So Drake may get a little bit of clout in Compton, but Kendrick has literally helped this entire business blow up because of social media, because of the Euphoria diss track. So I'm going to go ahead and play you guys that news clip right now. It's been an over a decade long feud and now a new Kendrick Lamar diss record targeting Toronto's own Drake has one local Chinese restaurant caught in the middle, but in a good way. New Ho King on Spadina was mentioned in the song Euphoria. And now the owner says they have since been showered with five star reviews. Talk about me and my family, Cody. Someone go bleed in your family, Cody. I'll be a new Ho King. New Ho King. There you go. <laughs> That's why I'm trying to learn how to sing the song now. Johnny Liu is the owner of New Ho King in Chinatown. He says since last night, his phone has been blowing up with messages. This morning, a lot of people text me. He said, oh, look at that. That's your son? I said, yes. And I said, oh. Look at that. Look at the song. Don't speak on the family, Crody. It can get deep in the family, Crody. In the song, Kendrick Lamar jokingly pokes fun at the Toronto accent and slang. He then specifically mentioned the restaurant and their fried rice. It could be a new hot king in fried rice with a dip sauce and a blammy, Crody. He said the food and might be the fried rice get more, more, more rice. The chef going to be busy. Since the song was released Tuesday, Google reviews for the establishment have been soaring with positive feedback, with most mentioning the song and their now famous dish. Oh, seven minutes ago. So people okay. are mentioning the song that Kendrick. <laughs> yep, I see that Kendrick's a good guy. Oh, my God. Lou says he expects more customers will be stopping by since he's been receiving this international attention. Even today, customers we spoke to said they made their way to Chinatown to try the fried rice, thanks to the American rapper. I came all the way from Markham just to see this fried rice, man. Kendrick Lamar, you got to pay respect to K-Dot, man. Ever since he dropped the diss track, I was like, I got to visit this place. It's been an over a decade long. All right, so you guys just watched that news clip. So again, yes, you know, um, Drake may have had his moment in Cali, but Kendrick is definitely doing some things in Toronto, just basically, you know, based off of um, that diss track. But now what's very interesting is this, okay? This is how you know that K-Dot is diabolical, okay? Okay, so on top of him talking about the restaurant and the good fried rice and the dim sum, what a lot of people did not know is that Drake was robbed either in front of the restaurant, near that restaurant, years ago. That is where a robbery took place. Now, you know me, I put on my little internet detective hat and I went searching. Most of those articles have been deleted. They've been deleted, but I was able to find something that mentioned the robbery at gunpoint. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, I'm gonna show y'all this really quick. So they're saying here, the Canadian rapper was robbed at gunpoint in 2019 at a Toronto restaurant, according to the New York Times, okay? So when I went to go do my research on this, the only thing I could find was this. It's literally been scrubbed off the internet. But do y'all see that? What happened after two men robbed Drake at gunpoint? And this was back in 2010. So it's literally been scrubbed off the internet. That was the only thing I could find. So this is clearly some industry talk that Kendrick Lamar knows about. Hence why he brought that up. So it wasn't just about the fried rice and the good food, but that was a shot at Drake. Like, yeah, I know a lot of secrets that you may not think that I know. People are definitely telling me some stuff. So Drake probably wasn't expecting, you know what I'm saying, him to know about that, but he brought that up. So now I also want to touch on um, some more stuff that he said in 616 which is basically there's some type of, you know, there's there's a rat in his camp, there's a mole in his camp, some type of stool pigeon in his camp, okay? So this is what K-Dot raps. He says, are you finally ready to play? Have you ever, have you ever is such a big game on Euphoria? They play that in that show. So I believe him asking him, like, are you ready to play? Have you ever? He got that from Euphoria. That's another shot at Drake, okay? So he says, um, let's see, have you ever... Thought that OVO was working for me. Fake bully. I hate bullies. You must be a terrible person. Everyone inside your team is whispering that you deserve it. Can't Tootsie slide out of this one. It's just going to resurface. 
Every dog got to have his day, now living your purpose. It was fun until you started putting money in the streets, then lost your money because they came back with no receipts. I'm sorry I live a boring life. I love peace, but war ready if the war ready to see you bleed, okay? So that was him responding, again, like I showed y'all um, in my Euphoria breakdown. Pusha T had also confirmed this, that Drake put out 100 grand for people to find dirt on Pusha T. And Pusha T was like, uh, there's no skeletons over here, so you're wasting your money. Well, allegedly, Drake is doing the same thing. He wants people to find dirt on Kendrick and bring it back to him. And Kendrick is saying, there's no dirt that you'll find because I like living my life in peace. I like having a nice, boring life with my family. Chad, I agree with you, Kendrick, okay? I love my boring life and my boring house, you know what I'm saying? I love being at home, you know, chilling and being in my peace. When you got a nice house and you've worked hard for it, you ain't got to run the streets, okay? So I definitely feel Kendrick on that. And he's also talking about here, like, you know, you're a dog, you're not a good friend, you're a bully, and you need to live in your purpose, okay? So basically, once again, calling him out. Then he goes on to say this, 100 niggas you got on salary and 20 of them want to see you as a casualty. One of them is actually next to you. Two of them is practically tired of the lifestyle and just don't got the audacity to tell you. So this is really interesting. So everybody's trying to figure out who the mole is, who the rat is in OVO, right? So there's a lot of wordplay in here, but basically, you know, he's saying that he has 100 niggas on salary, but 20 of them want to see you as a casualty, but one of them is actually next to, next to you. So to me, I think that's a metaphor. He's saying 20 guys, right? They want to see you as a casualty, but there's one standing next to you. 21. 21 savage. Allegedly, okay? It could be 21 because think about it. 21 Savage is really close to Drake. They've done the joint albums together. You know, they're really good friends. But 21 Savage also owes a lot of his loyalty to Atlanta. Him and Metro Boomin are really, really good friends, okay? And even um, back in April, Metro Boomin has sent out this tweet concerning the whole 21 Savage situation. So remember, Metro Boomin said this. He says, what I look like sub and savage we were on the phone for an hour two days ago. Y'all should know something was up then, but negativity and bad news travels faster and further than anything else. And he wrote that April 2nd of 2024. So basically me and him and 21 Savage are still good. So my thing is this, I'm just the type, I don't I don't play with disloyalty. You can't, you, somebody who's friends with everybody is a friend to no one. Y'all and I have said this time and time again on my channel. Um, I don't fool with people who, oh, well, I want to be cool with both of y'all. At that point, I'm going to make a decision for you. Ain't no being cool with both of us. You just need to stand over here with that person. I, I don't I don't like funny energy. I don't want to feel like I got to walk around on eggshells or like I can't talk to you as a friend because you're friends with somebody who's clearly my enemy. So to me, 21 Savage is looking really compromised. You can't be up here, you know what I'm saying, pillow talking with Drake in one instance, but then you're still pillow talking with Metro Boomin and you know they don't like each other. Remember, your homeboy said, shut your whole ass up, Metro, make some drums, nigga. Okay? He disrespected him on that track. That was the funniest line. And you're still talking to him? No, no. Somebody who's friends with everybody is a friend of no one. That's how I feel. So I feel like the stool pigeon, the snake, the rat could be 21. I'm just saying. I don't have proof, but I'm, that's just what I'm thinking. But y'all know Kendrick, he loves his double entendres. So let's go back to the lyrics. He says, a hundred niggas that you got on salary, 20 of them want to see you as a casualty, and one of them is actually next to you, and two of them is particularly tired of your lifestyle, but don't have the audacity to tell you, okay? So when he says two of them, he could be doing a math equation, right? Because he says there's 20 of them that want to see you as a casualty, so 20 times two equals 40. Now, y'all remember 40 is, you know, Drake's really, really close friend. He's been there for him. You know, he's a producer as well. He's been with OVO from the beginning. Um, he's also sick. He's battling, I think, like multiple sclerosis, if I'm not mistaken. 
But um, so 40 could also be the stool pigeon in the rat. Because remember, when everything first went down with Pusher T, and he, you know, made the story of Adidon where he busted out Drake for having a secret child with a porn star, everybody, well, Drake thought that Kanye was the one who told Pusher T this. And this is what really started the beef with Drake and Kanye is because Drake was basically saying Kanye did it, Kanye was guilty. And then when Pusha T finally did the interview, he told the world, like, no, Kanye didn't tell me anything. I don't even think Pusha T and Kanye are even as close as they used to be, because we all know, like, ain't nobody, you know, good music done fell off. Let's just keep it real. So I don't think they're even as close, like, where Kanye would be pillow talking with Pusha T. But Pusha T came out and said flat out, it was, it was 40. 40 was pillow talking with some girl. He was airing out all his grievances about Drake and how he was tired about, you know, of Drake and his attitude. He was getting very arrogant, his ego, and that he had a secret son. So the girl was out here pillow talking with other people in the industry. Okay. So this was common knowledge in the industry. So Kanye knew about it, but he never told Pusher T. So Kanye basically caught a stray from Drake. And ever since then, they've just kind of been, you know, high key beefing. Now, another reason why I think. 40 could be involved. If you guys remember, back around 2022 when Mega was going through all that stuff with Tory Lanez in the trial, this was before Tory was even found guilty. 40 was seen in the comments of this post that was posted by um, the One Canada Project. He was seen in the comments clapping with clapping emojis, basically showing support to Meg the Stallion. And a lot of people thought that was weird because 40 is literally like one of Drake's best friends. And if you guys remember around that time, Drake had went in um, low key on Meg Thee Stallion when he was saying, this bitch lie about getting shots, but she's still a stallion. She don't even get the joke, but she's still smiling. Remember that was on Sir Loco. So for him to be liking that post and showing Megan love, I kind of sense some disloyalty slash Drake is getting on my damn nerves. So it could very well be 40 as well. So I could definitely see this being 40 as well, if my math is right. 20, you know what I'm saying? Two times is 40. Just saying. <laughs> I love these breakdowns. I swear they make you really think. Then Kendrick goes on to say this. He says, you know you can't sleep. These images trouble you. You know the wires in your circle. It should puzzle you. If you were street smart, then you would have caught that your entourage is only there to hustle you, okay? So that wire part is very interesting because to wear a wire means that, you know, you're working with the police, you're working with the feds. And also, remember in the back-to-back -back disc, around that time, Meek Mill had just gotten out of, you know, prison or whatever. And so... Um, on that track, Drake was yelling, you know, y'all need to check him for an earpiece. Y'all need to check him for a wire. Basically insinuating that Meek Mill was a snitch, okay? And that, you know, he was police, he was feds. And of course, he's saying that because Meek Mill is the one who basically told the world that uh, Drake uses a ghostwriter, who was at the time Quentin Miller. So... I feel like that's a double entendre for Kendrick where he's talking about there's somebody in your camp who is probably fed, working with the police. Basically, they're telling all your business. They're, you know, legitimately probably wearing a wire or, meta you know, just metaphorically wearing a wire. But then it's also a reference back to what Drake was saying about Meek Mill on the back-to-back -back diss. Just saying, okay? Then he goes on to say this near the end. He says, you're playing nerdy with Zach Bia in the Twitter bots, but you can't hide behind Wi-Fi. Your little memes is losing steam. They figure you out. You forcing opinions, not convincing. Y'all need a new route. It's time you look around on who's around you before you figure out that you're not alone. What would Mike do? Okay, so that was a crazy ending. And basically, Zach Bia, um, he allegedly runs like a Drake stand page. And all they do is make memes for Drake. And a lot of these memes are going at Kendrick and saying that Drake is the best. Really, Drake told me, he just sent me a voice on my birthday. And it was just like, happy birthday. I love you. I miss you. I'm so dialed into finishing up my book and my tour and working on music that like, it's like I'm sad I'm missing your birthday. Cause I'm really in this zone of just work, 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 work. And on that note, so much of the last five years has been about us going to experience these things out in the world in these parties he's like we got to bring that to tour he's like so if you can come like you got to come open up on tour and we got to just bring the music to the people on the party to the people and people got to come experience 
how we are in real life. Like that's what the show is, yeah. and that's just how Drake is. And so I just go on, going in there and play whatever music I think is fresh and have a fun time with the crowd. But really, like my job is so easy. It's the best crowd. They're waiting for the best show. They're already amped up. I just got to play the hits and have fun with them. You know, once again, Drake has all of these high level connections. And a lot of people say that he has these high level connections in the industry because he's part Jewish. So let's let's talk about you being Jewish real quick. Let's do that. Because a lot of people think that like Asher's Jewish. Right. He's not. His dad's Jewish. He doesn't really identify. All loves to Jews, but he's yeah. not Jewish. Yeah. You on the other hand. But he wasn't there. He didn't read his portion. First of all. You didn't have a bar mitzvah. Come on. Are you serious? You had a. Hold on, ladies and <sighs> gentlemen. Just tell. You don't understand how big you're about to be in the Jew world. Right? I, you don't understand how big. <laughs> you're Yo, you, you, first of all, I live in an all Jewish area, so where, I went where to is a, that? Forest Hill. Okay. I went to I went to a predominantly Jewish school growing up. I definitely had a bar mitzvah in an Italian restaurant, mind you. <laughs> My lord. Yeah. A nice Italian restaurant. A very nice Italian okay, okay. restaurant. Uh, the song of the night was Backstreet Boys. I want it that way. You are younger than me. My yeah. Friend. I forget about that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and yeah, man, I was in there. I was in synagogue. I had my yarmulke on. Hebrew school, the whole nine. You did. No, you see, I didn't. I cheated. I didn't really. So you just did that. No, no. Your I parents. Just the money. Your parents are nice. Yeah. So they let you do the bar mitzvah without having to do the fucking Hebrew school. Mm -hmm. So your mom's Jewish. My mother is Jewish, um, and you know we have we have great we have great Jewish dinners like Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. First text message you ever sent me. Good Shabbos. Yep. Good Shabbos. Kept it. He kept it real. Yeah. Are, have you gotten approached yet by like the Jewish media yet? No, I haven't gotten approached by the Jewish media, but somebody today, who I won't mention, was like, you know how big you're going to be? And I was like... Wait, that was that me five minutes ago? You're talking <laughs> about I remember saying that. Somebody's like, you know how big you're going to be? And he's like, this has never happened before. It's like every, every Jew is going to just like really embrace Well, the here's project. the thing. There are Jews like my dad who like cling to like the biggest reaches. Yeah. Like, you know who's Jewish? Matt Damon. I'm like, no, he's not, Dad. He's definitely not Jewish. And like people reach, and the fact yeah. that you actually identify, yep. that's going to be like, that's going to be big. Yeah, it's going to be great. You're doing something that I could never do. You're so that was a, you know, a little bar right there. And then he also goes on to say that, then he goes on to say that you're using all these bots and you know, you're not gangster. You're not hard. You're really nerdy. You know what I'm saying? The only thing you know how to do is post memes and gifts. Like, you know, you're not going to win this war with Wi-Fi. This is a street battle. This is a rap battle. We need bars. So you posting all these memes and posting, you know, messages between you and your mom. We don't care about that. So he's basically calling him out. But the most interesting part was the end, because as we all know, Drake, child, he swears up and down. He's Michael Jackson. OK, Bro, I run away from Michael, nigga, beat it, nigga, beat it. if you guys remember in the music video, first person shooter, he had on a white glove like Michael Jackson in the song Way Too Sexy, you know, with Future. He was dancing like he was MJ. And then he also tied with Michael Jackson for having 13 top charting hits on the billboard. So he definitely has compared himself to Michael Jackson a lot. And so Kendrick is basically saying, you know, you're not alone. You're not alone, buddy. Okay. Somebody in your camp is pillow talking. And that is also a reference to Michael Jackson's song, You Are Not Alone. Now, what's very interesting about the song, You Are Not Alone, uh, Michael Jackson was performing that song with his then, then wife, Lisa Marie Presley. And one of the things that was said back then, it was a really strange video. He looked super pale, um, but people said that the marriage was a sham. Um, Lisa Marie Presley was Elvis Presley's daughter. People just felt like there was just something that wasn't genuine about the relationship. Um, so a lot of people were talking about this back in like 92 when this came out. Um, they were here. It was just a weird video. Like it just, it was strange. I like the song though, but the video I can do without the, <laughs> yeah, I just like the song. Um, but anyhow, this came out, okay? around the time that Michael Jackson was fighting child pedophilia allegations. So I also believe that this is a double entendre because he was going through a lot of controversy and a lot of people, if you guys remember any old school tea sippers, you know, we were shorties back then, but a lot of people were saying that he only got with Lisa Marie Presley to basically dead or subside the rumors that he was sleeping with underage boys. Okay. So I think that that's also shot at Drake because Remember, well, I found out during my live stream that Drake had paid somebody like $300,000 to settle a sexual assault allegation, okay? 
And then since then, he's also been linked to like really young girls. So I think like this whole you're not alone is a double entendre um, with everything that was going on with Michael Jackson, plus with somebody in his camp running their mouth, meaning that he's not alone. Like you're not really private when you think you're talking to your boys privately, you're not. We're all there somewhere in the background finding out the tea. So when he tells him, you know, what would Mike Jackson do? That's, you know, that's definitely food for thought. Um, it was even rumored a long time ago that Michael Jackson had fired his whole staff and entourage after the Beat It music video because he was just frustrated. He just, you know, he didn't feel like he could trust the people who were around him at the time. So he fired everyone. I'll never forget when he was making the Thriller album. There were many people in the industry that said to Michael, you know, Michael, you can't expect this album to sell as well as Off the Wall. The industry's changed. But he and Quincy in this very studio kept working on that album. And Michael would not turn that album in until he was convinced that it was perfect. And then in classic Michael fashion, as soon as the second single was released, Beat It, he let everybody go from his team. There was no manager, no agent, no press agent. It was Michael, and he would give me business directives and, of course, the label promotion directives. He fired everybody? Everybody. Why? He just felt he wanted to run this business himself with the help of myself and, and a couple of others. And then also recently, last year, uh, Prince Michael Jackson, who is Michael Jackson's son, he did a podcast interview with Mike Tyson. It was a pretty good interview as well. And during that interview, he said this. Let me pull this up and show y'all. So as you see, this is um, Michael Jackson's son, Prince Michael. And during that interview, he was telling Mike Tyson that Michael Jackson had a target on his back. Michael Jackson was paranoid about his safety and pissing off the wrong people his son Prince reveals. So I believe that that's another warning to Drake. Like even your idol, Michael Jackson, realized that he had the wrong people around him. He had pissed off the wrong people. And, but he didn't get a chance to cut these people off before it was too late. He ended up passing away. So that last bar was definitely a lot of food for thought. Now, one last thing that I also like about this diss track is that if you guys remember in the TaylorMade uh, freestyle that he had um, using the Tupac AI, Drake did, um, he was basically saying that Taylor Swift, you know, runs Kendrick. Kendrick knows not to drop when Taylor Swift is dropping and that basically Taylor Swift is the new top. She's the one who's running the industry. Um, and so he was saying that, you know, you better not drop. You're going to act like because Taylor Swift just dropped her music, all of a sudden you're not in a feud. You know, you're not dropping no diss track because, you know, you know Taylor Swift is going to overshadow you. Well, if you guys don't know, this song 616 was also produced by Jack Antoff. And Jack Antoff is a pop producer who's known for collaborating with Taylor Swift. Okay, so when I tell you Kendrick is diabolical, child, he is very diabolical. He knows what he's doing. Um, he makes no apologies for it. Either you're going to rock with him, you're going to get in line, or you're going to get rocked over, okay? So the fact that he went to go hook up with Taylor Swift's producer and put them on this track is insane. So it's going to be very interesting to see what Drake has to say back. Now, Drake did post this about 20 minutes ago, so I'm going to show you guys what he just posted because everybody's talking about this on social media. So once again, you know, maybe Kendrick is right. Drake is over here playing these AI games. Let me share my screen real quick here. Uh -oh. So I can't play the movie clip, but basically Drake posted this in his stories. Um, he responds to Kendrick with the Denzel Washington Equalizer 2 scene. I'm going to kill each and every one of you. Okay. So that definitely sounds like some type of warning. I don't know if he's talking to the alleged snitch in his OVO camp or if he's talking about Kendrick, you know what I'm saying? Kanye, Metro Boomin', Future, The Weeknd, Rick Ross, all these folks who are coming at Drake. You know, he's talking about he's coming for every last one of them. So it's going to be very interesting to see if Drake ends up dropping this weekend. I'm definitely here for it. I hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown. And I want to know y'all's opinion on the song. How do y'all feel about everything? Are you guys here for the Kendrick Lamar, you know, part two? What I found very funny, though, I got to say this on social media, is that a lot of people were saying, oh, I feel like Kendrick is doing too much. You know, why is he dropping another song? I'm like, the nerve of the Drake fans to say that. Did Was Drake doing too much when he dropped Charged Off and literally 
48 hours later, he dropped back to back, which was Grammy nominated. Oh, he wasn't doing too much then when he was going after Meek. He didn't even give Meek Mill a chance to respond. And then let's not forget, he not only dropped Drop and Give Me 50, then he turned around and did the tailor-made freestyle with the Tupac AI and the Snoop Dogg AI. So he was baiting and hoping for Kendrick to respond. Kendrick responded with Euphoria, which most of the guys on the internet definitely love that song. And I think most of the ladies do too. And then he decided to pull a Drake on Drake and drop 616. So what is the problem? Why is it okay when Drake drops back to back, but when Kendrick does it, he's doing too much. But I think what it is though, I will say this. As far as this song, you know, it, I like it. I mean, it's cool. Am I, I you know, am I going to play it over and over again? Probably not. I like Euphoria better. Um, I think the reason why this song is getting some pushback, it's almost like you have to do too much deciphering of Kendrick Lamar's music. Like you have to like really know his music, the backstory. And a lot of, you know, rap fans or just casual listeners, they don't have time to like break down and decipher and get to the nuances of stuff, you know? Because I couldn't tell you how many messages I got today. Like, can you please do a breakdown? I'm so confused. I don't get this. It's like the, the casual listener, they just want to listen to like just something fun with a good beat where they can dance to. And that's what Drake provides. So for the casual listener, um, Drake's song, Drop and Give Me 50, that's a fun diss track. It really is. It's funny. It's lighthearted. He's talking about small feet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so... I can see why people can digest that easily because you could pick up a lot easier on Drake's disses than you could. Like when Drake was like, Mitchell, shut your whole ass up and make some drums, nigga. Like everybody picked up on that. Whereas with Kendrick, he goes way more deeper. And some people, are they don't want to hear all that deep shit. They just want you to just be gutter, say what you got to say. I don't want to sit here and decipher Bible quotes and, you know, look up dates for when OJ killed Nicole. People don't want to do all that. So I, I, I get the pushback. I get when people are like, this is boring. I don't like this. Just talk regular. Stop talking, you know what I'm saying, in hieroglyphics. Just rap, you know? But for people who are deeper thinkers, I can appreciate his body of work. I can appreciate the fact that he goes a lot deeper um, than Drake. But, you know, I got to give Drake his props, too. I did like Drop and Give Me 50. That bangs. I like that. And when it comes on, I'm going to dance to it. And that song is a lot easier to memorize, too. So I did like that song. But Euphoria, Euphoria was definitely, um, it was well written. I really like Euphoria. 616, this song, it's okay. You know, um, I get the bars, I get the, you know, what he's saying, but is it like, I don't, I don't see this playing in the club. I just don't. Whereas like back to back really played in the club. Like that really was a jam. I've been hearing drop and give me 50 on the radio. Euphoria is doing big numbers right now on Apple and on the iTunes chart and stuff like that. So people are definitely listening to Euphoria. I don't know if this is going to get that same level but people do like it and respect it, but it's definitely not something that you're just going to be like rapping to like that and dancing to, whereas you will with Drop and Give Me 50. So I think that's where the disconnect is for some fans. They're just like, this is way too deep. It's not that serious. I don't care. <laughs> and then you have me who's like, you know, excited, like to break this stuff down. So hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys enjoyed my take on it. Can't wait to read y'all's comments and thoughts. Leave them down below. If you're not subscribed to my channel, please subscribe. Make sure you're still subscribed because I love to unsubscribe people, honey, okay? Also, don't forget to hit the video with a like and feel free to share this video as well. And if you guys want me to do more breakdowns on rap songs, just, you know, let me know. Talk to y'all later. Deuces. If you want the latest news in the streets, join us and tune in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So sell your friends and your family. It's the lovely TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe.